start now? Yeah. Hey, you're through the books, boys. You got Dean on the line. Who's calling? Charles Salzberg. Hey, Charles. Wow, what a coincidence. We were just talking about your book, Canary in the Coal Mine. So I've got I've got a copy of it here, and I absolutely loved it. So it's great that you've called in. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you. So I was I was reading this, and this is this is exactly the kind of book I like because I'm a big big fan of that detective style um, stuff, crime books, and everything. In my teens, I read a lot of crime stuff. You know, John Grisham, Jeffrey Daver. In my later uni years, I read a lot of Agatha Christie and things. I think I got a shelf with 75 Agatha Christie novels on it. So I, I love my, my, my crime book. So I was very excited about this. And I initially thought, okay, let's check it out. Um, you know, this is um, something I'm not used to, but this is not your first book. You've read a lot of books. So do you want to tell us how you got into it in the first place? Sure. But first, let me give you a, a, a little um, sort of bit of trivia. I actually interviewed Jeffrey Deaver. Wow. And Jeffrey Deaver, here's the, the, the little tidbit. Before he even starts to write a book, he has to write an outline, mm. detailed outline that can be as much as 120 pages or more. Um, wow. So the outline is, is almost a, a novella in itself. <laughs> right. If I had to do that, and I don't, I, I don't know what <laughs> I'm writing, I, I wouldn't write the book because it, I would be bored with it by then. Yeah. Um, anyway, I, I'll, I'll make this rather quick. I was an English major, um, at, which prepares you for absolutely nothing in the world. <laughs> and I wanted to, um, I, like a lot of English majors, I wanted to write the um, great American novel. And then I got out of school and realized no one was going to actually pay me to do that. Mm -hmm. So um, I stumbled into someone said, oh, you're an English major. You like to read. <clears throat> Maybe you should become a magazine editor. So I got a job in the mailroom at New York Magazine. And um, I learned very quickly, I did not want to be a, um, an editor because they all looked bored and they were there all the time. And yeah. they didn't, uh, but the writers, they would roll in around 10, 1030. They drink coffee, they talk on the phone, they you know talk with the editors. They leave at noon around 2, 230. You could smell alcohol from the <laughs> They were coming back from lunch. And then they did the same thing in the afternoon and they left at four. And I thought, that's the job I want. That's so the one you want. Yeah. That's the one I want, the writer for magazines. And so I, I you know, I'm going to make this really short. I did, you know, sell an article uh, and became a magazine writer, journalist, having no training for it. And then that, that led to writing book reviews for the New York Times. And then someone asked me to ghost write a book with them. And then I did some nonfiction books, but I always wanted to write novels. And so I wrote this novel called Swan's Last Song. And I wrote it now, it's about 30 years ago. And at the time, they, it was a detective novel, but it was what a friend of mine called an existential detective novel, mm -hmm. because in the book, the detective does not solve the crime. The crime turns out to have nothing to do with everything, well, every clue he's followed throughout the whole book. And so editors and agents said, we, you know, this, the writing is really good, but we can't publish this because fans of detective novels, they want, they want, you know, closure. They want, they the, want the, tip, the typical. Yeah. Yeah. And so I got, I was really stubborn. I was probably in my, you know, early thirties maybe. And I said, well, you know, screw you. I'm going <laughs> to put it away. And then 25 years later, I started thinking about it and I went back to it and I thought, this is pretty good. If I update it, maybe publishing has changed and I can get it yeah. published. So I did. And by that time I had books published and I went to an editor um, and he read it and he said, I love this book, but not with this ending. So I said, okay, how about if I change the ending? And he said, yes, let me see it. Brilliant. So in 25 years, I learned how to sell out. <laughs> and that was the first book and as i was telling you before the, it was nominated for a big award called the seamus award which is um, given out by the private invest private detective something and i lost and i got pissed off and said i'm going to keep writing these till i um win something and what happened along the way is i fell in love with writing crime novels because everyone likes crime and I, I don't do murder mysteries, really. But although this one is, it's the first one. 
where you have to, where the detective has to find the, the murderer. Mm -hmm. uh, there are very few dead bodies in, in my books, except this one. So this one was a little different and it was a challenge to me. So that's how I got into writing okay. and writing crime novels. So this might have been a good one for me to start on as someone who comes from a Agatha Christie kind of background with a lot of mm -hmm. dead bodies. This maybe was the best one to start with then. Yeah, um, but even, even so people, I have a friend who once said to me, you know, you with all your endings of all your books are ambiguous. You're not quite sure of what, what happened. And I said, yeah, that's purposeful because life is like that. Um, I have one book called Swan Dives In, which is the same character from the mm -hmm. first book, where you don't know what the crime is until halfway through the book. And by the end of the book, you're not even sure there was a crime. And so those are the kind of books that I kind of like to read, but um, traditional readers of, of Agatha Christie and the people you're talking about, might be a little bit um, pissed off at me um, at the ending of some of my books. <laughs> this one does have a, a, a real conclusion, but still yeah, it's a little it bit ambiguous. Cool, and um, PJ, you've joined us. Um, I've joined you guys, yes. Um, Hi, I, um, nice to I'm meet in you, a I'm in the worst place to be interviewing someone. Sorry, I'm in a kid's summer camp. So I, I <laughs> muted myself. Um, but yeah, I was listening in, in, listening in a bit to what you were saying. Uh, nice meeting you, Charles. Nice meeting uh, you. Yes, glad you could join us. And um, you're in Italy? I'm in Italy right now, yes. Um, so um, it's very hot. Have you ever been? I've never been to Italy, no. Okay, okay. Well, it's a lovely place. I'm getting... Um... It's a nice day in New York City, too, where I am. Oh, lovely. Okay, lovely. Well, I for like the, the record, it's an unusually nice day here in Ireland, so... Is it? <laughs> what? That, that can't be. So the triangle has been fulfilled. <laughs> but I like I like the idea of an... Um, I was listening in a bit. Of an ambiguous ending, as you were saying, that it's real life. Uh -huh. You're right. I like that kind of stuff, too, yes. So, I mean, I would, I would enjoy that as well. And... Um, if someone gets, I think people are, are turned off because they want life to be so logical. They want, they want to make sense out of life, but you, you just exactly. can't make sense. Exactly. Really, that's what detective fiction is, is the world, you've got the world and it's in order and then suddenly happens and it's thrown into chaos, usually a murder, right? And it's the detective's job to put everything together, to put the world back together and make everything good again. Mm -hmm. uh, but the problem is the world doesn't really work like that. Um, so, yeah. Uh, but that's why people like it is, is it, it solves a problem and leaves the world in a good place. What I like about it is that our detective, Fortunato, he doesn't, he doesn't want to fix anything really. You know, he no. just wants to get himself out of the situation. He's kind of like, oh my God, I've been put into the situation. I'm going to do the minimum amount to get myself out of it. You know, he doesn't care about what's what's going on with the dead husband and the lover and all of that and the mafia. He's just like, what's the least amount of work I can put in to divorce myself from this? Right. It, it's all about him. And, and he he's uh, he, he's not a happy guy. First of all, he suffers from um, anger management problems. Yeah, he's got a real temper. <laughs> and uh, the other thing is he, he suffers from insomnia, which doesn't help the anger part. So, no. so, so, so. You know, I think that you're absolutely right, it, it, Dean, is that that's that's the character I wanted to, to create. And, and I think it's more, of a, it's more of a realistic character, isn't it? I mean, the detectives, I, I think most of the time they will be wanting to go home and watch the next Seinfeld episode. Right. They don't always be there. <laughs> well, you know, so they, in, in these days, especially in this country, if you're not pissed off, there's something wrong with you. You know, if you're not perpetually pissed off, because you should oh, be. <laughs> <laughs> I, I see a lot of, and you see it in TV shows as well, you know, these kind of cop TV shows, and they're like staying after hours, and they really care about the case. And I think, no, this is more realistic. This guy's just like, get me out of this. You know, what, how do I tick a box and say I've done the job? You know, that's more realistic for me. Right. It's a living to him. It's, you know, yeah. not a good living. Yeah. So, so, yeah. And yeah, that's a good, it's not a good living. He doesn't, you know, he's not rolling in money here. He's not charging astronomical right, fees. Right. He's well, struggling he, for work. Right. He, he doesn't even have an office. He has a desk in a friend's uh, real estate company. Yeah. Uh, that he so, might not yeah. be able to keep all year round if the, if the firm gets that's busy. Right. That's <laughs> right. If it gets busy, he's out on the street. Well, Putting in the hard right. graft. I want to ask you about the, so 
I want to ask you about the other character, Travis, a little bit, um, because I couldn't figure him out. I couldn't figure out, at times you think he knows a little bit more, but he's not telling Fortunato. But then I couldn't figure out, well, is he being sneaky or devious, or is he just not that bright? And he doesn't realize what it's important to tell and, and isn't connecting the dots. You know, he's not a detective. He wants to um, go down more artistic routes, you know? So maybe he's just not that bright. You know, what's your take on that? Is it meant to be ambiguous or is it? Yeah, I mean, I, I, don't you think most people are ambiguous? And, and you've actually paid me a compliment Probably. because <laughs> I, don't, I don't want, I try to write characters that are real and complicated. And the, the thing that, that um, the, the, the best way for me, I think, is to look at someone like Travis is, and I, I don't want to defame an entire um, industry, but most actors, and that's what he is, you know, a, a wannabe actor, yeah. have narcissism problems. Let's a little bit, it. maybe. <laughs> yeah. As, a, as my friend Charlie Shulman, who's a playwright, once said to me, he said, don't ever date a woman with a headshot. And so, you know, it's it, so, so they, they are complicated. So I think you've hit all the things. He's not that bright, but he's also, um, you know, he can be cunning. Yeah. You know, he's not, he's not a, a, a fool, but if you took his IQ test, he wouldn't, you know, he'd be average. Mm. Um, but there are a lot of average people running around. Yeah, I guess that's true. And my, my favorite, so we, we, don't, we don't really meet the husband, obviously, Donald. He's, uh, he's worse for wear when we first see him, let's say. But, but the wife, Lisa, I love her because she's got that sort of, she's got a bit of a don't mess with me attitude, but also that entitled rich girl attitude at the same time. And you always know that she's devious. You know, with, with Travis, I was thinking, well, is he devious or is he just not that smart? With her, I'm thinking she's very smart and very devious and she knows what she's doing. Right, and and she will get away with whatever she can. Yeah, and and the two things about about her that that should tip readers off is she hires him to find her husband dead or alive. So right away she's admitting that he might be dead, and, and she doesn't reason, seem very bothered by it either. <laughs> no, not at all. She just doesn't want to be blamed for it if if, if he is. And the other thing about, and I'm not really giving anything away because it's not a big plot thing, is she pays him because he, he does find her husband. I won't say how, but she pays him with a bad check. So yeah. the check bounces. So there's that sense of entitlement, which you mentioned, Dean, that, and that's the tip off is that sense of, you know, I can, I can do anything I want. I don't have to pay you, um, you know. Uh, so, yeah. so, so she is. She's much more... Um, you, 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 you know who she is, and I'm sure that people know people like that. Whereas some of the other characters are much more, uh, more difficult to pin down who they are and what they want. Yeah, you know who she is, but she's also not an out and out villain, you know? No. Where the, the only real villain, I suppose, is the, the, the Albanian mob. You know, they're the only yeah. ones that are true bad guys. Um, and why are they bad? Hmm? Boy, were they bad. Oh, yeah, they're very, they're very bad. Um, they're very, you know, terrifying everyone. But at the same time, they're also not main characters. So the main, the main right. three characters are really right. just trying to sort their own lives out. And they just they're, they're happen there to, be... to Right, they're there to propel the plot forward. Yeah. Pretty much. They're there to propel the plot. And, the, you know, the main guys are really... Is it fair to say that all three of them are just selfishly motivated? Like, they're just trying to sort their own life and... Yeah get untangled from this web. <laughs> no, no, none of them will, you know, will, there'll be no statues like for Martin Luther King. Or no. <laughs> they're, they're not out for, uh, to help humanity, that's for sure. But yeah. I think, you know, I, I hate to be cynical, although I am, most people are more, more like that. <laughs> you know, it's what, what's in it for me. I think so, I think so, yeah. Yeah, survival, right, yeah, totally. And let's ask you the next the next thing that everybody always I, I like to ask every author. But what's what's next? Like, have you started into the next book, or is it time? Yes, for a break? Well, I've actually I finished one that uh, I had a novel. It's actually my favorite one. It's called Second Story Man, and it's about a um, uh, nice. uh, uh, a master burglar who is actually a combination of two real life burglars. One was called the Dinner Time Bandit, 
because he only hit houses during dinner time because A, <laughs> the jewel, he knew that the valuables would be there and B, he knew everyone would be down having dinner and he would, you know, he was a second story man. He would climb up and steal ah, it. From and the, top. the other guys called the silver thief. He only stole really high end silver. So um, I created this character who is really about, um, to me, the book is about America's uh, obsession with winning and being the best mm -hmm. and what can happen when you're like that. Mm -hmm. And anyway, so he, Francis Hoyt is his name and he, two people um, get together to bring him to justice. One is a former Connecticut state investor, uh, investigator, and the other is a Cuban American uh, Miami detective, a cop. But anyway, the reason I mentioned that is that book ended and I started to think after I wrote Canary, what happens to, um, to, um, to Hoy, the burglar, after Second Story Man ends? Mm. And so I thought, oh, that's worth a book just because I want to see yeah. what he's like. He's not a likable character at all. Right. And so the book that's coming out in April is called um, Man on the Run. And it's the, I don't like to call it a sequel. It's kind of a continuation of Second Story Man. And the one I'm working mm. on now is a, a character who has uh, a touch of ESV. Okay. Um, and a little bit of social commentary by the sides of things as well, which is good. Yeah. Um, that's yeah. interesting. So we that's like, we like a bit of that, don't we, PJ? <laughs> <laughs> so the final question that we ask on every interview um, is if there was any book, any existing book that you wish you had been the person to write, what would it have been? Easy, Lolita. Oh, right. Now, PJ, you've read Lolita, Ooh. haven't you? No, I haven't read that, oh, Lolita, haven't? actually. But no, no, no. Highly recommend but, um, I haven't read it. Like, the whole time. It's, it's why, why would you recommend one? Because the writing is so incredible and the wit. And the whole idea of it, uh, you, you'll, you'll see when, when you read it, and I highly recommend it. And this was written by a guy whose native language was Russian. Probably his second language was um, French. Okay. And yes. English was probably his third language. Third, yeah. And his use of language, puns and allusions is so incredible. You can read that book 10 times and get something new out of it. So if I could have written, and there are other books that I would have liked to have written by favorite authors, but that's the one that's the, the most intricate and mm. at the same time, the most accessible. Okay. Uh, I've not read it, but I, many I people believe, have recommended it over the years, you know? And I believe Nabokov translated it's, it's, it's his own book back into Russian because wow. he thought he could only get the essence of it uh, right. in, in his native tongue. That's what I read at least. So. Fascinating guy. It's in, my, it's in my never-ending queue of books that I need to get to one day. <laughs> right, he, yeah. he wrote a book because he taught at, uh, at Cornell and he wrote a book called Pinin, P-N-I-N, which is about a college professor that's very much like, um, like Nabokov was. Mm -hmm. Well, we've got about a oh, minute well. or so left here. So why don't you give us a plug? Where's your website or Amazon or where can people go to get the book? Oh, okay, you can get all my books at, on amazon.com or barnesandnoble.com. And my, my website, which I did not do, but a friend did, charlesalsberg.com is really fun because you go there and uh, Swan, one of my characters has a desk and it's interactive. And we nice. also did three or four videos, oh, wow. short videos of Henry Swan uh, from the books. And my friend Ross Clavin did the Henry Swan voice. So it doesn't cost anything. Wow. You don't have to buy a book, but I suggest you go to the site. Play around on the site. See, you're just showing off now. Our website looks like it came out of the 90s. We are- uh, <laughs> <we're> not... <laughs> Again, I have nothing to do with it. I have a really quick <laughs> website story to tell you. Can I do it really quick? Sure. Okay, so I was invited down to Australia, never been there before, for the International Crime and Justice um, Festival. And I was the guest of honor. And I went on a, uh, a radio show down there. And I'm coming back from the show on the, on the trolley, the tram. And I'm with the, um, the guy who sponsored me. And I look at my email and there's an email for me from someone I don't know. And I open it up and it's from a woman. She says, hi, I just uh, heard you on, um, on the show, on the radio show. And I thought you were great. And then I went to your website. This was a different website. And I think it's ugly. 
It's really oh, ugly. No. 